Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our sermon text for our meditation this morning is our gospel lesson for this Sunday, recorded for us in the Gospel of St. Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 51st verse. I invite you to please rise for the life of our Lord. When the days were approaching for him to be taken up, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him. They went and entered a Samaritan village to make preparations for him. But the people did not welcome him because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. You don't know what kind of spirit is influencing you. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's souls, but to save them. And they went to another village. As they went on the way, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another man also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those at my home. Jesus told him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord, these are your words, and therefore they are your truth. We ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Dear fellow redeemed, what sort of commitments have you made in your life or do you have in your life? Maybe commitments concerning your skill or ability, commitments to a job or a career, Maybe commitments as of time, such as to a club or to another organization. Maybe you've made financial commitments to repay a loan or a mortgage. Maybe family commitments to a spouse or to children and so forth. There are many commitments that each and every one of us here have in our own lives. But which of those commitments would you consider to be total commitments? that you would be faithful to carrying out that commitment no matter what. I think in our world today, there are many people that don't think too highly of commitments. Well, continue in the commitment as long as it's beneficial to you, as long as it makes you feel good, as long as it makes you feel happy, do it. Be faithful to that commitment, but if not, you can just quit. You can just find a new job. You can just get divorced. You can just file bankruptcy. That's okay. You don't have to be totally committed to whatever it is that you have committed to. In our lesson for today, though, we see something very different. As Jesus requires total commitment. He requires total commitment following him. We see with these men, these three men, one who asked to follow Jesus, the other two that he asked to follow him. Absolute commitment in following him. So we take that up as our theme for today. Following Christ requires total commitment. Verse 57 of our lesson says this. As they went on the way, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Now from the Gospel of Matthew, we hear that this individual was an expert in the law. And so it appears that he wants to follow Jesus as his rabbi and he to be his disciple or pupil. A very noble thing to want. And yet Jesus responds, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus wants this man to know what this is going to mean. Yes, maybe he's known as a very prestigious rabbi, but it doesn't mean that life is going to be easy for him. It's not going to be filled with prosperity but rather instead hardship and difficulty and suffering. In fact, just a few verses before our lesson for this morning, Jesus said, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. As following Jesus requires giving up much, requires suffering and hardship. Then we go on in our text. As Jesus invites another man to follow him, the man responds, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. 
Now this seems like a reasonable request, a noble request. The man wants to go and carry out some earthly commitment that he has, and then he's going to follow Jesus. What does Jesus say? Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It seems so cruel for Jesus to say that to him. Jesus, don't you understand? He had this earthly commitment to follow through on, to bury his father, and then he'll be faithful to you. Then he will follow you and commit himself to you. Let him do that first. Jesus makes clear that following him comes even above earthly commitments. And we get to the third man that Jesus invites to follow him. That man, too, is ready to follow Jesus. He says, but just let me go say goodbye to my family, and then I'll follow you. Here, too, Jesus rebukes the man. He makes clear that that even commitment to him comes above family obligation as well. Jesus goes on to even say, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. He draws this picture for the man and for those in his hearing of a farmer who's plowing his field that he can't have his head turned behind him as he's plowing. Otherwise, he's going to produce crooked furrows. No, the only way to properly plow, to properly go about that work is to be facing forward, to look at the task ahead, not what was behind. And So Jesus clearly lays out that following him requires a total commitment total commitment, even leaving behind maybe the niceties of life, willing to endure hardship and suffering, sacrifice, leaving behind earthly obligation and family obligation as well. In fact, one must be totally committed to him. It's quite a tall order, isn't it, to be totally committed to Christ above everything else. To endure hardship, suffering, pain, sacrifice for him. Have we really realized the cost of following Jesus and what he really requires? I think many of us would say, yes, of course, Lord, we'll follow you, right? Have we been ready to really commit ourselves fully to what he says in his word for us today, to be totally committed to him? Perhaps are we more like that groom who two months after the wedding finds out that his new bride is pregnant and then it dawns on him the commitment that he has undertaken in marriage. As he wonders what's going to happen in nine months from now, as he thinks about everything he's going to have to give up, his time with the fr- his friends, he's going to have to give up so much of his financial resources, that new car out the window as he understands truly what that, the cost of the commitment that he has made, as he understands what it now involves. When it comes to our own marriages, who of us really fully understood the full commitment that we were making on the day when we made our vows to be completely committed to the other person? And how often we have failed in that full commitment toward one another. Not only in our marriages, though, but especially in our commitment to God. And so often we've promised, God, we will follow you. Jesus, we'll do what you say. We'll be your faithful followers. But then when we're faced with difficulty, hardship, or persecution, or pain, quickly we say, well, maybe not now, Lord. I'll follow you, but in my own way. Well, I'm never going to do that. We have certain reservations. We maybe see in our own lives that we really haven't been totally committed to Christ the way that we've claimed we are. Instead, well, God, I will follow you only on my own terms. We see that's not the commitment that Jesus requires. He requires absolute, total commitment to him and to his word. We see how far we have fallen short, committing ourselves to Christ. We also see this, though, in our lesson for today. As we go back to the very beginning of the text, we see a very different commitment in Jesus. We hear about Jesus traveling from Galilee down to Jerusalem, and he goes through Samaria. 
Which in and of itself was a very unusual thing for a Jewish man to do. Because the Jews hated the Samaritans and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And yet Jesus goes through their land, showing that he comes even for them. And he invites his disciples to go forward and make preparations in the next village for him. When the Samaritans hear that Jesus is coming, though, and they know that he's going to continue on to Jerusalem, they don't want him. They despise him. They reject him. Perhaps their rejection is because they know that Jesus still has a heart for the Jews. He's still concerned about them, and perhaps the Samaritans only want Jesus to be on their side. Or even more so, certainly, as they understood he was going to Jerusalem and they hated that city of Jerusalem, the Jews said that was the only place where one could properly worship God, where they said it was a different place. They despised Jesus as he was heading to Jerusalem. But Jesus was going to Jerusalem for this purpose, to suffer and die on a cross, and not just for the Jews, but even for them, even for those Samaritan people. He was going for them as their Savior, too. And how ungrateful for them to reject this Savior. We see the response of these disciples, James and John. They want to call down fire from heaven to destroy these ungrateful people. Get rid of them. What does Jesus do? Jesus says no. Jesus endures their rejection. Jesus allows himself to be wronged and dishonored and disrespected by them. Because as he says, he did not come to destroy people's souls, but to save them. That was his purpose. He was totally committed to that purpose of saving sinners, even those that rejected him. We might say, though, Jesus, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Everything you're going to have to suffer at the cross, especially the agony of hell. Yes, maybe, Jesus, suffer for those that are committed to you fully. But don't suffer for those that don't care about you. Don't suffer for those who aren't committed to you. It's not worth it, Jesus. Don't suffer for their sins. Only suffer for the sins of those that are totally committed to you. But if Jesus did that, whose sins would he suffer for? Would he be able to suffer for your sins or for mine? Again, who of us have been totally committed to Jesus in our own life, totally committed also to his word, willing to sacrifice everything, willing to endure hardship and ridicule and suffering and pain and unhappiness for the sake of following the Lord and his word? None of us, right? But Jesus goes anyway, doesn't he? He sets his face resolutely towards Jerusalem, even knowing the cross that lays before him, even knowing the people for whom he goes, people filled with so much ingratitude and unthankfulness. I think of that famous Palm Sunday hymn, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty, in that second verse it says this, Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, your triumphs now begin, or captive death and conquered sin. Jesus knew what lay before him in Jerusalem. He was riding on, he was heading on to Jerusalem to die. And he did so because he knew that only that would actually solve the problem of sin. Only that could make us, who were separated from him by our sin, his own dear people. And so he goes. He goes there because he's totally committed to us. He's totally committed to you, to you who don't deserve it. Totally committed to you who's been fickle so often in your own faith and life. Before you, he places himself under the torturer's whip. He places himself under the executioner's hammer and nail. He doesn't do it because you're so faithful to him, but because he's so faithful to you. Because he's internal, eternally committed to you. And through it, he forgives all of your sin. He forgives those times when you thought of only of yourself instead of him. When you wanted to go your own way instead of his. 
He goes to the cross to suffer for those sins, those wrongs. You see, following Christ does involve total commitment. The only commitment that could make us his was his commitment to us. His total commitment in suffering and death on the cross to you. Only that could make you his own dear child. His total commitment to you. And also sending God the Holy Spirit to work in your heart faith. To believe and trust in him as your savior from sin. You see, Christ has been totally committed to you. And thanks be to God for that because we haven't been committed to him. Because of his total commitment to us, we are his own dear children and forgiven in God's sight. And we have the certain hope of everlasting life. You know, this time of year is kind of wedding season, isn't it? I think of just this past weekend, there were two weddings here at our church, Peace Lutheran. And so often, young couples desire to choose their texts for their weddings to be read. One text that's often read is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's called the love chapter. It's often chosen because the, the young couple views it as an expression of their love for each other or maybe their wish of their love for each other. When we read through that chapter, we see really how impossible it is to love in the way that God requires how much better it is for us to view the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, not as our love for each other, but especially to view it as the perfect love that God has shown to us and his commitment to us. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not behave indecently. It is not selfish. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never comes to an end. Doesn't that so perfectly describe our God and our Savior? Christ is patient. Christ is kind. Christ is not selfish. Christ does not keep a record of wrongs. Christ bears all things. Christ endures all things, even the cross for you. And his love never comes to an end. As Christ was totally committed to you and to your salvation, through his death on the cross, he has guaranteed you the forgiveness of sins and eternal life forever in heaven. May that motivate your own commitment to him and to his word. May we commit it to the one who has totally committed himself to us. Amen. I invite the congregation to please rise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be forevermore. Amen.